What makes Jacksonville a city? Historically, cities developed because they were places of commerce. People came to the city to buy and sell. Located here on the St. Johns River, approximately 18 miles from the ocean, Jacksonville's natural environment encouraged its growth and subsequent development. Today, with its unique combination of buildings, streets, bridges, homes, parks, and people, Jacksonville is much more than a setting for modern-day commerce. Jacksonville represents the natural, urban, and suburban environments intermingled. But we can't forget the natural environment supports our city and our activities. In this program on our environment, we will examine Jacksonville's physical attributes as we look at the past, why Jacksonville developed the way it did, the present, our current development, rate of growth, and the competing interest within our community, and the future, what form will it take? Jacksonville is here because of the river. The British built King's Road to join their colonies in Georgia to St. Augustine. The road crossed the St. John's River at a narrow point called Calford because it was here that cattle crossed or were ferried across the river. A ferryman's house and a tavern for weary travelers were built here and Jacksonville had its beginnings. You see, my family had been already here before there was a Jacksonville. It was known as Calford from its British days. Um, and a name that's misunderstood, no cow could cross the river, they could swim across because it was always deep at this narrow point where the Venturi action you know, carved out the depths. But if we go back to the beginning of the city, it always was centered on the fact that the river was its heart. The river was its soul. And there would be no city where Jacksonville is if that river had not been there. The river was its heart. The river was its soul. Some say the St. John's River is the most important asset we have. Uh, the St. John's River is very, very important to Jacksonville. In fact, uh, it is the reason for Jacksonville being here, just like it was the reason for Calford. It was a place where water and land transportation crossed. And it created the importance of the spot geographically. And that's why the Calford was here. And then that is why the city of Jacksonville did succeed following um, the um, United States acquisition of Florida. In 1822, after Florida was ceded to the United States, three men, Lewis Zachariah Hogans, John Brady, and Isaiah D. Hart, planned a 20-block town on the north side of the river. They named it Jacksonville, in honor of Major General Andrew Jackson. And so you see, Jacksonville was birthed, you might say, by the river. Birthed by the river. If we are here because of the river, we must remain sensitive to our natural beginnings. As free land was offered to newcomers, people settled first along the river because it was an easy way to travel, and the river provided many amenities. Despite raids on surrounding plantations and farms, Jacksonville began to grow. Residents petitioned the Secretary of State to designate Jacksonville as a port of entry for foreign trade. This date, believed to be June 15, 1822, is accepted as the founding date of the city. But in the early days, because that river was there and because we had a reasonably uh, warm climate, Jacksonville became the tourist city of the United States. It was, a, it, it was not the furthest south city. St. Augustine was, but Jacksonville had the river. St. Augustine did not. Jacksonville became the mecca of not just the United States, but <clears throat> people from Paris and London came here uh, to enjoy the winters and the sunshine. The beauty of the river and the appealing climate did bring many visitors to Jacksonville. Great hotels were built which offered fine food and good music. The St. James Hotel, which stood where the May Coins building is today, was one of the finest tourist hotels in the U.S., as well as the Windsor, the Grand National, and Carlton House. The 1876 city directory listed 12 hotels and three dozen boarding houses. Tourism flourished. But if the railroad helped to establish Jacksonville as the tourist city of the country, it also contributed to the demise of its tourist business. 
a man by the name of Mr. Flagler, who is well known these days, came in and built a railroad, the Florida East Coast Railway. And um, he built the bridge, which is um, uh, right, runs right along parallel to the Acosta Bridge. That railroad bridge was the first crossing of the St. John's by any kind of a structure. The, the railroad then was run to St. Augustine and the Ponte de Leon and uh, the other ho hotels and buildings were built by Flagler down there and the tourists started going to St. Augustine and before long the railway inched its way on down, you know, over the years. So Jacksonville uh, became a non-tourist town, though people were still coming here even to, to the turn of the century. And then, of course, at the turn of the century, the greatest disaster that ever befell a city was the fire that destroyed Jacksonville. On May 3rd in 1901, a fire broke out in a moss fiber factory, quickly swept toward the business district, and within eight hours destroyed everything in its path. 146 city blocks had burned. Over 2,000 buildings were destroyed. 10,000 people were left homeless. But the people of Jacksonville rallied and began rebuilding their city. The city grew at an unprecedented rate, and within 10 years, an entirely new city was built. A New Yorker named Henry Clouseau and other notable architects designed commercial and residential structures in a new style, which we now call the Prairie School of Architecture. By 1913, Jacksonville's population had grown to more than 85,000. It was Florida's largest city. Jacksonville also became America's winter film capital. Hundreds of movies were made here each year, and the shipping industry continued to grow. Because of the port, Jacksonville became a major distribution and export center. When I was a boy, the downtown Jacksonville and riverfront was uh, wars for uh, commercial uh, vessels coming in, unloading bananas and uh, various things, taking them off the Clyde Mallory line, for instance. Uh, had its boats coming in here and running to uh, Philadelphia and New York and so on. Other industries also found Jacksonville attractive, and over the next three decades, a strong commercial base with a diversity of interests was built. Jacksonville was growing. It was now an established city with a good metropolitan environment. But in our rush to build and rebuild, had we forgotten about our natural beginning? What was happening to the natural environment, our support system? The river was, again, was forgotten. The tourism had dropped off, and what happened? Railroads were then built. Uh, some were already there, I must say, but were built along the waterfront to carry cargo from the ships that were still coming in from all over the world to the trains which were uh, leaving for other points. So Jacksonville became a hub for transportation of things. It did not become a place for people to enjoy life. And here was this great gift, this great river flowing there. And uh, no one could use it because the city didn't address itself to the river. Just the commerce of the city did. As Jacksonville grew, the river was not only neglected, it was also abused. Although travel by steamboat up the river to Green Cove Springs and Palatka was not uncommon, the downtown riverfront remained a setting for commerce. Raw sewage was dumped directly into the water with little or no thought given to the effects on the water. Following World War I, little changed in Jacksonville. The Acosta Bridge, then known as the Jacksonville-St. John's River Bridge, was dedicated. San Jose and San Marco were developed. But during the boom days of the 20s, most of the construction in Florida was going on south of here. When the Great Depression hit, Jacksonville fared better than many other cities. The economic diversity of the port helped the citizenry weather bad economic times. Because we had a good port and a port that you could get into, plus we had very good distribution from this port, the rail system and highway system out of Jacksonville is ideal. And its location also enables it to serve the southeast rather than just parts of Florida. During World War II, Jacksonville's identity shifted from that of a metropolitan port city to one of a shipbuilding center. Due to the cold winters, shipbuilders in the north could not work long 
but in Jacksonville, warships could be constructed 24 hours a day, 12 months of the year. Hundreds of Liberty ships, Victory ships, PT boats, and minesweepers were constructed here. Jacksonville was the nation's wartime shipyard. The boom years of the 50s followed the war. A surge of growth occurred, but for the most part, it was scattered and unplanned. A general planning axiom states, wherever you build a road, people and development follow. And this is what happened on the north side. Arlington exploded when the Matthews Bridge was completed. The population of Duval County climbed to over 450,000 by 1960. The downtown riverfront changed from a setting of docks and warehouses to a cityscape of skyscrapers, bridges, and parking lots. Uh, but what had happened was that never was a consideration of an overall holistic plan for the city considered. And it was just allowed to grow according to uh, real estate greed. That's all, I don't know how to put it, it's still with us. Real estate greed created the city and it had nothing to do with the quality of life that was possible had some thought been given to it. Uh, so the city did grow, but it grew badly. In 1968, Jacksonville began a new era in its history with a consolidated form of government. For purposes of government regulation, the lines of the city of Jacksonville merged with the lines of Duval County. With the new form of government came new attitudes toward our city and its natural environment. Let's take a look at the Jacksonville of today. Jacksonville has so much vitality that's just beginning to wake up. So many of us have felt like this city has so much potential, almost like an empty canvas. Jacksonville's not too big, and yet it's big enough to have enough people to support the amenities that make life worthwhile. Uh, the, the past of Jacksonville has, has historically uh, had some major national significant points. At one time, we were, in the 1870s, we were one of the tourist meccas of the entire eastern United States. Uh, around the time of World War I, we were one of the film capitals of the world. And uh, all those things have kind of died back. And now we see Jacksonville, because it has not been overbuilt, overpopulated, and yet it has a wonderful location. I, I was told by one of my friends who, who uh, is a great visionary to look at Jacksonville on the map and you'll see that it has one of the best locations for a city in the world. It's on the ocean, on a magnificent river. Uh, very few other cities, maybe other than Paris, France, in the world have as perfect a location as Jacksonville. Without Jacksonville sits in, a, in an interesting position environmentally because we are at the southern extent of a salt marsh environment, we're at a northern extent of a mangrove environment, and all of these things come together here in Jacksonville. You've got a large river that flows through the city that added a tremendous plus to the environment when people started coming here. And when you look at development in the area, you see that people want to build on the river. They want to be close to the water. It's hard to really pinpoint what the attraction is for water, but when you recognize that 80% of the population in the United States lives within 50 miles of a body of water, you begin realizing that we're tied to water. Perfect location, warm climate, located on the St. Johns River within easy access to the Atlantic Ocean. Jacksonville has other advantages that we sometimes take for granted. Right, well Jacksonville's been very fortunate uh, in the development of the city and that we do have a very abundant water supply. We don't need to do a lot of treatment. Uh, most surface water supplies require a fairly uh, large degree of treatment which is very expensive, whereas here in Jacksonville our groundwater uh, is very high quality and ready for uh, people's use pretty much as we take it out of the ground. The availability of an abundant water supply has certainly been a contributing factor in the growth and development of our city. But how abundant is this supply of water? Is it an unlimited resource? Uh, for groundwater here underlying all of Duval County, much of Northeast Florida in fact, and it uh, it's been said that it is an unlimited water supply. It is not. All, all I think all uh, natural resources are finite to some degree, but it is going to require management. All natural resources are finite. If we don't take care of our natural assets, we will lose them. We have to manage our resources rather than abuse them without concern. But 
An increasing population is placing demands on our resources far beyond our expectations. Can we balance our increasing human needs against the availability of our natural resources? Can we have growth without paying the price environmentally? We addressed this question to Dr. Thomas Lipscomb, a retired physician and lifelong resident of Jacksonville. Can we have growth without some unmixed blessings? No, you can't. Because you can't possibly have, uh, in the old days when the stoves were fired with coal, you couldn't have uh, uh, 50,000 homes burning coal without soot all over the place. You, uh, whenever you take land that previously has been in grass and weeds and whatnot, and you cover it with asphalt, the water doesn't soak into the ground, it just runs off. So that, uh, that again is an unmixed blessing. It's nice to have a parking lot, but what do you do with the water that otherwise would have run into the ground? What do you do? Currently, there are more than 10 million residents of Florida. We are now the sixth largest state and growing. More than 5,000 new residents move to Florida each week. We may be the fourth largest state by the year 2000 or sooner. The population of Jacksonville now exceeds 600,000. Can we assimilate three to 6,000 new people a year in this community alone? We got to do uh, more about dealing with particularly growth management and the directions of growth is traveling uh, in the state of Florida. And a recent public opinion survey showed, which is very interesting, 15% uh, more than any other uh, group felt that growth management was the top issue in the state. 11% more felt environment was. When you combine those, it was 25%, more than twice that of any other issue identified. So I, I think that uh, the issue of the environment and growth are becoming very prominent in the minds of, of Floridians, and I expect to see it uh, considered very uh, actively in the next few sessions, and we need to because of the growth of the state. And indeed it was considered. In the legislative session following this interview, Representative Mills sponsored a growth management bill to control land use and to protect environmentally sensitive areas. Growth management has become the number one priority of the state. The legislature has already ordered regional planning councils to develop standards for directing growth and to make statements concerning regional impact. The Northeast Florida Regional Planning Council, headquartered here in Jacksonville, is responsible for reviewing all major developments above a certain size within a seven county area. To prevent the so-called bad growth, this 28-member board reviews and comments on projects regarding regional impact. Dan Castle, executive director of the Planning Council, addressing the mayor's committee on growth management. In terms of growth and development in this area, back in 1977, we were projecting a population of about a million to a million and 100,000 within the seven county area. We seem to be constantly revising those estimates or projections. Currently, we project that we're going to be about 1,400,000 by, by the year 2000. As you can see, that's a substantial increase. If this is to occur, and we feel very confident that it will, we're looking at a population increase of approximately 20,000 people per year. And converting that to uh, residential dwelling units, we're looking at a need for some 10 to 11,000 dwelling units to be constructed each year between now and the year 2000. Uh, to put that in a little better perspective, perhaps 20,000 people, you're looking at a community about twice the size of the city of St. Augustine being uh, established each year within our region. 20,000 people a year in a seven county area. As our population expands, we must consider and plan for the expansion and maintenance of our support services. The City Planning Commission is also concerned about the projected growth. This planning body is responsible for the day-to-day -day review of projects and sets policy for the planning efforts of the city. How can we make the planning process more effective? 
Uh, it has to have the right kind of public involvement, and ultimately it has to go through the, uh, the legislative process. There has to be that commitment beyond the playing, the legislative process. And, uh, and then I think with that particular encompassing uh, approach to planning, you're going to get a more serious uh, commitment to, uh, to planning, and planning will become more effective. I guess it's basically how it's done. If it's done the right way, I think planning can become more effective. A basic element of effective planning is housing. Do we have housing available for our new residents? If housing is available, can the average citizen afford it? Uh, the price of housing is a whole other subject that we could, we could spend another interview on. Uh, and it's, it's approach, approaching uh, somewhat of a crisis proportion, I think. I've forgotten the kind of products we build. I think we can only uh, house the top 15% of the market. And, uh, and uh, the needs of the rest of the market have got to be met. And um, it's, it's going to be, that's a real challenge for the, for the next 20 years. If at our current rate of development, we are able to provide housing for only 15% of the population, what do we do with the other 85% of the people? And in addition to housing, we need to consider our support services. What about waste treatment, electrical power, drinking water, police and fire protection? And what about our streets and roads? Can our support services keep pace with our rate of growth? Take Mandarin, for example. We can see the terrible destruction that's happened in Mandarin. Mandarin, 10 years ago, was a beautiful pastoral neighborhood where people were moving in order to escape some of the, uh, the hubbub and uh, uh, strife of living in the city. And as soon as it became popular, every developer in town moved out there and bought up property and, and uh, they've been rezoning it right and left to allow more and more people to live in an area. And now we can see the spillover of that where uh, Mandarin, is, is, instead of being a pastoral area, is becoming more congestion. The population there has grown so much faster than schools or highways or uh, electrical utilities uh, that they're in a real dilemma. About six years ago, the city council and citizens of Mandarin uh, developed, sought to develop a planning tool called the Mandarin Plan, which passed, which allowed for the proper and orderly growth of Mandarin. And on almost every case where a zoning issue has come up uh, that has been in opposition to the Mandarin Plan, the city council has approved it and let them override that plan. Plans obviously are not enough. How can we be assured that once a plan is in place, it will remain operative? There's been a lot of good planning done in the past. I would agree with John that probably if it's fallen down, it's fallen down at the implementation stage. A lot of good studies have been prepared. They've been uh, set on the shelves and uh, nobody's really followed through with them. Planning without implementation or lack of follow through. That's one reason offered for the lack of effective planning in the past. Another issue is the continuing debate concerning the rights of private property owners versus public good. Can we balance the competing interests among citizens, landowners, developers, and environmentalists? What do you plan for a community? There's a debate. We're seeing a debate now in Jacksonville between the neighborhood groups, the environmental groups, versus the development interests. Did you have that type of, of um, constructive discord, if you will, uh, back when you were working with the planning aspect? This has always been true, uh, I guess, since they first developed uh, cities. Always been true. Is there anything the individual within a neighborhood can do? We addressed this question to Dr. Wayne Wood, founder of Riverside Avondale Preservation Society. We started our neighborhood organization completely in the dark. We not only realized, did not realize that other cities around the country were having the same problem, but we really didn't know what the causes of the troubles were, and we quickly found out that zoning, for example, is one of the major troubles we have. And we need to just sometimes go out and shake our city leaders and say, look, these things are important. It's important that people can make money, but it's equally important that those of us that live in an area are able to enjoy the quality of living that is there. Growth is, uh, again, it's a pejorative or let's say a, uh, maybe a, a slanted term in many people's opinion. Uh, a lot of people, there's the old drawbridge syndrome where people, the old concept of the drawbridge where, where people 
want any additional growth or development after they've moved in themselves at that point, which is somewhat selfish and doesn't do me as a developer a whole lot of good. Uh, so I think growth uh, has to be controlled, but it has to be controlled with, uh, and this, the authorities that control it, the agencies that regulate it, have got to be aware that there are imaginative solutions uh, to growth. I think we've come to realize that everyone has to live and work somewhere. That's, that's part of our, our society. But at the same time, we've got to maintain our environment. And it's, as you're saying, we have to balance these two out. And it can be done through coexistence with a little thoughtful planning. A little thoughtful planning. Jacksonville has evolved from a calf ward where cows and weary travelers on the King's Highway crossed the river to a major metropolitan area and an international port. Our growth in the past has been sporadic, but most would agree that we have not had to suffer from the rapid, uncontrolled, and perhaps mismanaged growth experienced in other areas. We have been fortunate, but now we are at a crossroad in Jacksonville's development. We are going to grow, but how are we going to grow? One suggested alternative to uncontrolled growth is the restoration of old neighborhoods and the redevelopment of downtown. Jacksonville is very much like other cities across the country uh, that have grown up with a strong downtown center. The older neighborhoods grew up historically in almost a donut around that downtown commercial area. And then as time's gone by, the suburbs have gotten further and further away. Uh, unless we have people who are living around downtown, a downtown commercial area is not going to survive. Well, downtown Jacksonville right now is a work marketplace. If you can work to humanize that environment and bring in a type of development where people can come and simply enjoy themselves, and you succeeded in terms of downtown redevelopment, because this is the center of the city. This is where, in terms of Jacksonville, people come right now for cultural activities. Now, a key ingredient to doing, to making that happen and creating what we call our 24-hour urban uh, living environment is housing and residential. We're going to create a total neighborhood where you can live and work and play all in the same geographic area. And that's this city's vision and concept of downtown redevelopment. A 24-hour urban living environment. That's a far cry from the Cal Ford of our past. Jacksonville is definitely a city on the move, but where is it going? Where do you want it to go? In this program, we've discussed the physical environment. Mac, what can the individual do to have some impact on the kind of physical environment we'll have in the future? Well, my profession is a city planner, and I don't agree that I'm the only city planner. People are city planners. They need to get involved. They need to make their goals and aspirations known. And through our involvement, we can't forget that the natural environment supports the physical setting. Only by balancing the competing entities within the city will Jacksonville remain a livable community. As business and industrialization go forward in this city, we must also encourage and support environmental awareness. We can't forget our past. We must remember why we're here. Thank you.